Hi, my name is Lauren, and in August 2017, I visited the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or as it's more commonly known, North Korea, for five days. Um, I've been fascinated by Korean history and North Korea in particular for many years, so I wanted to visit the country for myself, and I did my best to film some of the things I saw. Um, given the nature of North Korea, um, you're not allowed to film anything you want. You have to ask permission to take photos of certain things. Um, you know, we weren't allowed to film the military or construction sites or things like that. So this footage doesn't contain everything I saw. Um, there are some things I would have loved to have captured, but I couldn't. Um, and obviously I am aware of the political situation in the country, and I'm aware that a lot of what I saw was probably not an accurate representation of life in North Korea. So, you know, take everything you see in this footage with a pinch of salt. I met up with my tour group in Beijing, where we got a train to the Chinese border city of Dandong before getting another train to Pyongyang. When we arrived at the border, military came onto the train and took our passports and searched through all our possessions. I have to admit this was quite scary. The view out of the window was really quite nice though. I don't know why I'd pictured North Korea to look so barren, but it was a lovely surprise to see such nice scenery. Upon arrival, we were taken straight to Mansude Hill, which contains the 22 metre bronze statues of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. We had to walk up the hill towards the statues in lines of four and then bow to them. Having just arrived in the country, I wasn't sure exactly how compliant we had to be or how easy it was to get into trouble, so it was quite a nerve-wracking experience. We then headed to dinner at a local restaurant. It was definitely not local and 100% set up for tourists, but it was good to have our first taste of Korean food, which I decide I really like. We woke up the next morning and headed straight to the demilitarized zone, aka the DMZ, which is sat right on the border between North and South Korea. So for a little bit of background, in 1950, the northern part of Korea invaded the South, causing a three year long war, resulting in the split of Korea into two countries, North and South Korea as we know them today. A peace treaty was never actually signed, so the two countries are technically still at war. And the DMZ is used as a kind of buffer zone between the two countries. And um, as you can see right now in the video, this is the joint security area, which is the exact point on the border. After lunch, we headed back to Pyongyang and rode the Pyongyang Metro. This metro station is actually the deepest in the world, at 105.5 metres deep. It also doubles up as a bomb shelter, in case there's bombs. Um, we rode for five stops with the local people, which was weirdly quite interesting. Um, apparently before 2010, tourists were only allowed to ride between two stops, giving rise to a conspiracy theory that the metro station was fake and that the passengers were actors. Obviously this could still be the case, but we rode for five stops. As we walked out of the station on our last stop, we were greeted with the Arch of Triumph, which is a huge impressive monument built in 1952 to commemorate the Korean resistance to Japan. We went up to the top of the arch and we were graced with a panoramic view of Pyongyang. As you can see, the whole city is painted in pastel colours and looks really quite pretty. I did however notice that there's really not many cars on the road, which I found really quite strange for an Asian capital city. After dinner, we headed to a fun fair, where we got to go on some rides and mingle with the locals a little bit.
On our third day in North Korea, we made the three hour journey to Mount Maihang, a beautifully scenic area in the north. This place was stunning with forests, lakes and mountains. We then headed to a temple complex called Poyon Temple. It was founded by a monk in 1042, but half of the complex was destroyed during the Korean War. It has since been reconstructed and was really beautiful to look around. I was actually under the impression that religion wasn't allowed to be practiced in the country and that, you know, Kim Jong-un is the only person you should be worshipping. We headed back to Pyongyang and visited the monument to party founding. This was built to celebrate the 50 year anniversary of the Workers' Party in Korea. It has a hammer, a sickle and a calligraphy brush as its features, symbolising workers, farmers and intellect. Next we headed to the Victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum. We weren't allowed to film inside the museum itself, but we were allowed to film outside the grounds. Our tour guide showed us a bunch of artefacts left behind by the US, such as aircraft, tanks and bombshells. The main building was newly built in 2014 in the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the Great Victory in the Fatherland of Liberation War. Destroyers, which was sent by coastal artillery men of the 20th Force Army while bombarding villages and towns. <laughs> US Army tank. The biggest one is 50 ton and the smallest one is 10 ton. Yes, fighter. It was destroyed by female anti-aircraft gunners of the Korean People's Army during the Fatherland Liberation War. This is the USS Pueblo, a research ship owned by the US Navy. It was captured by North Korea in 1968 and has remained here ever since as a sort of trophy. We watched a short documentary about the USS Pueblo and had to try very hard to keep our mouth shut at some of the things that were said. The documentary kept using the phrase, ignorant and stupid American imperialists. That evening we went bowling, which was quite random but quite a lot of fun. The next day, we put on our formal clothes because we were heading to Kamsu's and Palace of the Sun, which is where Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il were laid to rest. The whole morning made me feel pretty tense, and we had to walk around the palace in lines of four and we weren't allowed to speak. We had to bow three times to both leaders, once at their feet, once at their right side and once at their left side. It was pretty surreal to see dead bodies laid on display in this way, but they'd been preserved somehow with a kind of wax solution. We then headed to Kim Il-sung Square, which is really the only part of North Korea I've seen footage of before coming here. It's where they hold marches and stuff and is broadcasted on TV sometimes. Next we headed to Mangonde Native House, which is where apparently Kim Il-sung was born. Many North Koreans visit this place to pay respect to the late leader, and the home kind of portrays the family as humble and poor because it's very small and obviously not for someone who has great wealth. In my opinion, this place seems like a propaganda feature. There's lots of research that shows that Kim Il-sung wasn't actually born here, and North Koreans are just told that he was. We then made our way to the National Library, I expected this to be kind of boring, I mean it's a library, but it was actually really interesting. 
It gave us an insight into what Western literature the citizens are exposed to, which turns out isn't a lot, but they did have Harry Potter, Sherlock Holmes and the Beatles. One thing I actually only noticed while editing this video was this English textbook you see here. The book has sentences such as, the US imperialists have been the sworn enemy of the Korea people for more than a hundred years ago, and the US imperialists killed one fourth of the population of Sinchon County during the 52 days of their occupation. This is pretty harrowing for a language learning book if you ask me. We then made our way to a local school where the kids here put on a show for us. It was really good, apparently North Korean kids are taught singing, dancing and how to play musical instruments from a very young age so they're all really talented. And that's that, we headed back to China early the next day and um, I wouldn't say I was relieved to leave North Korea because I didn't feel unsafe there, but I was there in August 2017 which was when there was those huge tensions between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Um, I had no access to news or social media so I had no idea what was going on in the outside world. Um, you know, the situation between Kim and Trump could have completely blown up and I wouldn't have known anything about it so I felt kind of not in control in that sense. Um, but I really did get a lot out of my time there. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, you know, I, I have no idea how much of what I saw was real and how much of it was fake. Um, you know, the line between reality and facade is really blurry. Um, but yeah, that's that. Um, I'll leave my link to my blog in the description below if you want to check out some more of my travels or if you want to read more about North Korea. And thank you for watching.